Hello, SmartCon. Uh, good morning from uh, Melbourne in Australia. My name is Mark Richardson, for those of you who haven't met me before. Uh, I'm the research lead at Bancor. And uh, for today's presentation, I thought that we would have a, a quick look at why I think that the, the Bancor and the Chainlink communities have such a high affinity for each other. So we're going to be exploring a little bit about Bancor's past and then also talking about some things that we have in, in the future and how Chainlink is a part of that future. So to start the story, we need to actually go back in time to about April of last year. And this is when uh, Bancor first announced its, its version two. And this had a very, very strong integration with Chainlink price oracles. The mission statement for Bancor version two was to really try and alleviate uh, four of the main pain points that we saw for the use of AMMs by sort of everyday uh, people. And these are exposure to something called impermanent loss, um, the uh, requisite or the uh, involuntary requirement to be exposed to multiple items at once, capital inefficiency, which of course something that the, uh, the rest of the industry has kind of cotton on to since, and also the opportunity cost of providing liquidity. So to tackle that with our version two, um, we introduced something called liquidity amplification. So this is just a, a standard uh, chart. I'm sure most people will recognize this as a bonding curve, um, which has this kind of lovely hyperbolic uh, curve to it. And what we did was that we amplified that by, by 20X. Um, so in, in April of last year, we were calling this liquidity amplification, but of course there have been uh, several iterations on this idea and the, the industry has kind of adopted the term concentrated liquidity to describe precisely the same thing. How Chainlink was involved in this particular um, implementation of, of concentrated liquidity was that as uh, traders were moving the price um, by exploring you know, the, the curve in, in both the left and right directions, a Chainlink Oracle would basically read that current price and then adjust the weight of the pool accordingly. So we were using something called the strong invariant, which is slightly different to regular constant product. Um, but for those of you who, how, who are already using other amplified curve uh, liquidity protocols, you can think of this as using a Chainlink Oracle to automatically unstake liquidity and then restake it back in range every single block. So this was a, a hyper automated version of, the, um, of the, the concentrated liquidity model. And it was completely dynamic. Um, as the price moved around, the Chainlink Oracle would constantly readjust. So that sounds amazing. And I still think that it is uh, one of the most beautiful uh, AMM designs that, that's ever been, um, but it was ultimately unsustainable. And I think that we can learn something together by sort of uh, having a, a quick look at what the problem was, um, especially because I think that there are new projects that are stumbling into this space and with sort of naive expectations for how automation plugs into um, amplified liquidity models. So if you think about the, the blockchain, and the fact that the Chainlink Oracle is always acting on a particular block. That block is going to be influenced by the blocks that preceded it, right? This is part of the information that the Chainlink Oracle is responding to, as well as, of course, um, outside information coming from sophisticated market makers. Um, but really, the problem isn't with how the Chainlink uh, Oracles operate or even the design of the system. The problem is the adversaries that can predict exactly what that system is going to do. So what we saw was that the, the opportunists that would usually uh, arbitrage the pools to keep them in balance now have an incentive to unbalance the pools so that after the, the Oracle performs a particular action, then they can um, extract additional value from the system. So really, I think that the, um, the adversarial nature of, of Ethereum is something that people have dramatically underestimated. And this kind of concentrated liquidity approach, even combined with automation, it is, I, it is a, a problem, the scale of which I think is, is lost on many people that are stumbling into this for the first time. So I just kind of, I, I thought that, you know, being a, a conference for, for, for blockchain and for uh, chain link integrations, it, this is something that I, I don't want to see forgotten. I think that it's very easy to make these the same mistakes again and to sort of have a look at what Bancor did as the original pioneers of, of concentrated liquidity models and, um, and how to automate these processes. Um, you know, don't, don't repeat the mistakes that we made. Um, there's going to be uh, you know, new ways that this model can be um, improved. 
and you know uh, it's worth studying the past in order to not um, you know to not repeat uh, not to not see those issues come to fruition again. The good news is that these challenges are totally surmountable. We never actually stopped our uh, collaboration with Chainlink on um, on this model, and where uh, I am at least you know completely convinced that Bancor version two has not you know been put away for good. There will be uh, future implementations of the protocol, maybe even on other chains, that will allow um, the uh, original design to be implemented and work exactly as intended. So even though that model didn't work, um, our communities have remained really close ever since. And I think that what Bancor did next with um, its release of uh, Bancor version uh, 2.1 in October of 2020, um, really spoke specifically to the, the values of the Chainlink community. And that's why they kind of stuck around, even though we weren't really using the, the, um, the Chainlink price feeds at that time. So with version 2.1, we're really uh, focusing on just two of those mission statements that we set out to um, address with our version 2. And this is the um, exposure to impermanent loss and the uh, involuntary requirement to take exposure to multiple assets simultaneously. So if you think about your typical Chainlink uh, holder, right? I'd say that there's sort of two characteristics that, um, that I hope everyone in this conference will uh, agree that um, most of these uh, token holders uh, subscribe to. One is that they absolutely believe that the token will outperform the market, right, in terms of uh, its valuation over time. And then the other characteristic is that they are extremely loyal to their project. And if possible, they would rather not hold much else other than the Chainlink token itself, or at least that they find the, um, the idea that they are going to be forced to rebalance their portfolio to have less Chainlink in it is just unacceptable. And so if you're providing liquidity to AMMs, this can be problematic because both of these values are actually working against you in the status quo. First of all, if you need to hold two tokens at once um, and you need to hold these in equal proportion, then your, um, the, your portfolio, or at least the part that you're providing liquidity with, cannot, can be at maximum 50% chain link. And that's going to constantly rebalance as the um, as the prices move around. On Bancor version 2.1, you can provide liquidity with just one token, and you're not required to relinquish um, any of that portfolio exposure to Chainlink in order to participate in the platform. And so I think that this is one of the things that uh, that Chainlink enthusiasts really saw value in, and which is why they've continued to, to hang around and why our communities have remained so close. Of course, the other thing is uh, price exposure. So Chainlink has this uh, habit of going sort of parabolic compared to um, other tokens um, that uh, other tokens that you might be otherwise providing liquidity with, and this is unfortunate if you are holding both of those uh, tokens at once, and if you're providing liquidity with them for two different reasons. One is that. All of the tokens that you held that weren't Chainlink are obviously not going up as fast as Chainlink is going up. So you might regret that you weren't holding more Chainlink. Uh, it's something of a meme now to say, you know, can, can you ever truly hold enough Chainlink? Um, the other problem is that because the other asset that you're providing liquidity with hasn't appreciated as fast as the Chainlink has, then you actually end up holding less money overall than if you hadn't provided liquidity at all. So this is um, a, a price chart that I've taken from, I think this is the, the sushi swap data. So this is over the entire history of, um, of sushi swap, um, starting at October 2020 and extending to today. So this is the impermanent loss uh, versus uh, wrapped ETH on the on the link pool. And you know, I'm not bashing you, uh, sushi swap here. This is uh, you could have chosen um, any uh, AMM that uh, where link is paired to ETH to, to get this result. And so you can see that um, if you had started to provide liquidity at that point, and this is just an arbitrary point, I just chose it because it was the, the dawn of their project. Um, you can see that uh, liquidity providers would actually be down about 10% relative to doing nothing at all. And I, I find that unacceptable, right? That a liquidity provider has provided value to the, to the DeFi economy, um, should expect to receive some value from it. 
And so the fact that on a standard AMM, that you can actually have less value after performing this activity than had you not performed that activity at all is counterintuitive to me. So on Bangkok, you don't have to make that concession. This difference in the chasm uh, between the impermanent loss of, of providing liquidity and doing nothing at all disappears on version 2.1. So if you had provided liquidity on Bangkok when it launched in October of last year, um, you would actually be 5% up as opposed to something like 15% down. And I, you know, I hear sometimes that we should think of this as a trivial difference, but I don't think 15% is, is trivial at all. And I, apparently the Chainlink community doesn't either um, because we've now attracted something like a quarter of a billion dollars in, in liquidity. And we're still providing um, you know, uh, BNT rewards on, on the link side. And so this is still, I think, one of the best earning opportunities for, for Chainlink in, in, the, um, in the ecosystem. And so for these reasons, I, the Chainlink community has certainly hung around, I think, with, with good justification. Okay, so that's enough about the past. Uh, what I really want to focus on now is, is the future. Um, for anyone that's been hanging around in our uh, social channels, you'll know that we've uh, started alluding to the idea that we're building a new system. Um, and so this is our version three. I'm not gonna be able to discuss version three in detail on, on this call, unfortunately, but I am gonna give some more breadcrumbs as to what its, its functionality is going to be like. Um, and certainly nothing that we've, we've spoken about in public anywhere else. So with version three, we're really returning to these original mission statements for, um, uh, for what we set out to do with uh, version two. So if we can strike off exposure to employment or loss into multiple assets as being completely solved, then one of the things that you might want to talk about then is, is capital efficiency. What, how is capital efficiency going to be a part of V3? Well, I don't actually think that the thought leaders in this space have a very good, um, have a very good, position on what capital efficiency is or how it affects uh, market participants. This is just some simple math that you can do on Excel if you want to model this for yourself. But I want to make the point that blowing up the curves like this and calling it efficient doesn't necessarily mean it is efficient. So uh, the C factor that I've introduced here just uh, makes the, the curve get larger and larger. And uh, it's usually peddled that because of this uh, stretching of the curve, um, that means that there's less slippage on the trades and that makes it more capital efficient. But what I want you to realize and why I encourage you to take those equations and plug them into Excel and explore it for yourself is that what you're actually measuring with this amplification factor is the proportion of the slippage that's paid by the liquidity provider rather than the trader. So these blown up curves, what they're really doing is selling tokens at a discount and then asking liquidity providers to pay for that discount. This can actually be, uh, it, it can work, but what you're risking is that the, uh, the, de the demand um, for that uh, activity um, is outstripped by the cost of, of, um, of uh, supporting it. So the question that I want to I want to ask with these blown up AMM curves in in general is, for whom is this more efficient, right? Because it, from my perspective, it doesn't look like liquidity providers are getting a very good deal. So I'd say it's still an open question in the space as to whether or not capital efficiency has a good answer. Um, but I do think that there are components of capital efficiency or, or better ways to look at it um, that Bancor version three actually is going to be. Um, addressing, and this is the opportunity cost of providing liquidity. So I know many people in the Chainlink space are, are super excited to, um, to stake their Chainlink tokens explicitly on, on, on Chainlink and uh, provide part of that crypto economic security. And that means that uh, Chainlink community members are now have this choice, right? Are they going to provide uh, Chainlink tokens to, um, to an AMM or to a lending protocol, or are they going to participate in explicit staking? So with Bancor version three, you won't have to make that choice. We want to make sure that you can provide liquidity and do explicit staking at the same time using the same app. And so for me, that's a much better description of capital efficiency, right? The ability to do two things at once with the same capital um, and without having to expose uh, liquidity providers to the, to, um, the, the risk of selling tokens at, their, at, at a discount. 
um, I think is uh, a much more sustainable way to ensure that liquidity providers remain profitable into the future. I'd say that as well, that this is not necessarily something that has come directly from us. Um, we are actually listening to the Chainlink community. This is something that was actually asked for by a, a prominent uh, Chainlink community member, uh, Jiminy Crypto, and you can uh, read his proposal that he published to our discourse. This is still in the early phases. He didn't know about version three at this, at this point. So the description there might not accurately reflect exactly how it's going to be implemented, but rest assured, this is something that we are absolutely committed to and we're really excited to, to see launch. This is also coming back to a concept that um, Dan Alitza has called superfluid collateral. And there is a lot in this uh, Medium post, and I strongly recommend that you read the whole thing. He has points both for and against um, using this type of system. But I do agree with the conclusion that there is a, a, very, um, a very compelling argument to being able to use capital in, in more than one way simultaneously. And that that is um, likely to be the thing that kind of makes DeFi, um, you know, that, that really breaks that capital efficiency mold um, and, and, you know, uh, really uh, makes the, the whole process of, of providing liquidity or what we call liquidity or collateral um, much more sort of uh, much more general. Right. I think at the end of the day, people really just want to know that when they stake their tokens, that, that it is doing something useful and that they are earning money for providing that service. And at Bancor, we, we really want to make sure that you have the, the easiest, simplest and safest way of doing that. So um, just really quickly, I know I'm already slightly over time here, um, but just to let everyone know that we are very uh, excited to um, to rekindle our relationship with the with the chain link team and start integrating that technology again um, it's been a you know it, it's been a, an awkward hiatus for us uh, with the launch of version 2.1 um, but with the chain link technology starting to come back into our protocol where we're absolutely confident that it, we've got a, a bright future in front of us I can announce um, today on this call that the chain link keepers will be integrated with v3 from day one. And um, as more features for V3 come online, I've only discussed, I haven't even discussed 1% of what version three is right now. I've only discussed, you know, just the, this skin deep uh, part of it uh, as it relates to the Chainlink community. But as more and more of these features come online, things that I haven't even spoken about, just know that those features at the moment assume that Bancor is going to further integrate with Chainlink into the future. So thank you so much. I really hope that um, that you found this sort of uh, interesting and informative. Um, if you want to reach out to me privately, you can uh, feel free to contact me via any of these channels. Um, I also uh, encourage anyone who is interested in what we're doing um, to join the, the Bancor community calls. Um, these are announced by the, the Bancor Twitter. And at this point, I think uh, I'll end the call because I'm already uh, way over and I apologize, Andy, for, for taking up too much time. No apologies necessary. Uh, what else is there to say? I'm, I'm going to have the same reaction the community's having. I'm very excited to hear this news and very much appreciate your time. Mark, uh, I, I'd like to get together with you once these things go live and talk more about that. So let's, uh, uh, um, let's, let's do that. Thank you so much for your time and getting up early out there in Australia. We'll talk to you again later.